Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's very good to be with you this evening. I really appreciate the witness of your church and the bold witness uh, of your pastor in open air preaching in other ways. So uh, it's really good to be here this evening. That's perfect. Yeah. I want to make a, just a brief apology at the beginning. Afterwards, I cannot stay too long, partly because uh, we have some, some guests, uh, but also this is my third talk this weekend. My voice is beginning to go. But I hope to answer most of your questions during the talk. And if you have other questions, you're very welcome to email me. I have a website, professorstuartburgess.com. Uh, so please do email me any specific questions uh, that you have. So the talk this evening, creation versus evolution. Now, we just had that reading from the Book of Romans, a really relevant reading for today, uh, talking about man not having an excuse not to believe in a creator. And really, Romans chapter 1 is describing the spiritual battle for today. The world replaces biblical truth with the devil's lies. And we are in a big battle if you've been watching the news recently, some people have been talking about the war in Israel and saying that war is an almighty battle between good and evil. But the Bible speaks of the biggest battle, an absolutely fierce spiritual battle between truth and lies. The devil is the father of lies. God is the father of truth. And the topic this evening is all to do with truth versus lies. The world suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. That is what's happened throughout uh, history and there is no excuse for disbelieving in God. You cannot say to God on the day of judgment, well Richard Dawkins told me that the world could come about without a creator. That will not be an excuse before God. So this evening we're considering a spiritual battle. Truth versus lies. And again, I appreciate the bold witness of this church in standing up for biblical truth in all these important areas for today. Let me go through uh, a few lies. I don't know if you've seen uh, a, a book recently by Sharon James. Uh, I think the book is called, um, the well, it's, it's in the title is Truth Versus Lies. The the truth we must hold um, and the lies we are told or the lies we are told and the truth we must hold. And this evening I'm kind of copying her terminology, truth and lies. So firstly, the lie that evolution equals science. That is what's taught today in schools and also universities. So what children are taught is that creation versus evolution is faith versus science, but that is not true. This, this is, it's such a lie to say creation versus evolution is faith versus science. So why is that the case? Evolution involves blind faith in atheism. There are many things I could say, but I think a really key statement uh, and is from Sir Julian Huxley. In 1942, he said, modern science must rule out special creation. And it's such a key point because Sir Julian Huxley, who was, became a president of Humanist UK, he is humanist, he said to the scientific community, we must decide to push God out of science. There's no justification for doing that. It's an anti-science thing to do. But in the 1940s, this is what modern science did. They pushed God out of science. They basically said, we can only believe in uh, humanist, secular, naturalistic views of origins. It was not based on evidence. It was based on a decision, a decision to become humanist. The person who told me about this really key statement was Alan Linton, who was in the 
in this church for many, many years, worshipping in this building, Anna Linton, who was head of microbiology at Bristol University. He told me about this uh, quote, and he put it in the foreword to my book, Hallmarks of Design. That book was sent to King Charles, and he quoted this in his Reef lecture to 90 million people. He wrote to me and said, I'm going to make a quote from your book, from what Alan Linton said, and if you look up the wreath lectures that went to 90 million people, King Charles said, why should modern science rule out special creation? Why should science rule out God? It was quite astonishing um, that Prince Charles said that. Someone said that was very brave of him uh, to say that, but then another friend of mine said uh, he cannot be sacked or demoted, so it wasn't actually that brave of King Charles. So this is a key statement where the modern world said, let us decide to be atheist, humanist, not based on science uh, and, and not based on evidence. I'll just give you one other quote on this theme. Uh, this is an amazing admission by a modern scientist. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Now you may have heard so many times on the television and in schools, you should believe evolution because that's what science says, that's what the evidence says. But this is the truth. The truth is they are not interested in evidence. In fact, this, this quotation actually implies they know the evidence points to an intelligent designer but they decide to ignore it. I've spent over 30 years in academia, mostly at Bristol University, partly at Cambridge University, and also one American university. I've chatted with hundreds of academics, and the majority of academics who are not Christians, they tell me, of course, there is overwhelming evidence for intelligent design. Everyone knows it, but we have to ignore it suppress it, as Romans 1 says. And this person admits it. But sadly, these kind of quotes are not shown to school children and students at university. They think the evidence points to evolution, and it does not. Evolution involves blind faith in abiogenesis. What is abiogenesis? That is the theory that life could just jump out of a chemical soup some primordial soup. So evolution teaches that life just came from, uh, without any creator, it just jumped out of some chemical soup. Now, I've discussed this with hundreds of academics, and every academic I've spoken to has said there is no evidence for this whatsoever. In, most academics I've spoken to have said it's, it's a completely rubbish theory, even professors of microbiology. The more senior you go, the more honest they will be. But let me just give you a quote from Richard Dawkins. Uh, if anyone is enthusiastic about the evidence, he would be. But listen to what he says. We have no evidence about what the first step in making life was, but we do know the kind of step it must have been must have been whatever it took to get natural selection started by some process as yet unknown. So he hasn't got a clue. He knows there is no evidence. It's zero, zilch, absolutely nothing. It's blind faith in abiogenesis. And yet, with this kind of arrogance, we do know the kind of step it must have been. Why does he say that? He says it because, well, it's natural selection. His God is evolution. Evolution did it. Uh, one of my professorial friends at the university, professor of microbiology, he's not a Christian, and he said, yeah, evolution is like a magic wand. You just wave it and say, evolution did it. It's the God of the atheist. Evolution involves blind faith in macro evolution. I've done a lot of work myself on the linkage mechanisms in fish jaws. 
probably the leading researcher is a man called Westneat. And this is what he said about the incredible design of fish jewels. He said, the macroevolutionary history of labrid fishes is occasionally punctuated by major transitions in engineering design. Now, I read a lot of scientific papers. I can tell you what he's saying. He's saying evolution cannot begin to explain the design of fish jewels. He hasn't got a clue how it could possibly come about by chance evolution. And he is the leading researcher, and this is the leading journal. And he's saying, it looks as though they've been incredibly well designed. Well, they have been incredibly well designed by an almighty creator with infinite power and wisdom. And so if you're an evolutionist, you need this incredible faith that these things could evolve when all the evidence is that they could not evolve. Just a quick, uh, a very quick note on adaptation. Adaptation is something that happens. Darwin's finches adapted, peppered moths adapted. You can see it with artificial breeding of dogs and horses. You can make uh, big changes in size and color, shapes and patterns, but a dog is always a dog. A horse is always a horse. Finches are always finches. It's very limited the amount of change you can have through adaptation. And adaptation is, is a wonderful thing that God has designed. In fact, if you just look at Genesis 31 and Jacob's sheep, you can see that people have always known about traits and adaptation and breeding. But as for abiogenesis, macroevolution, human evolution, there is no evidence for those things. And if you read a biology book and you look up what is the evidence for evolution, it will only give you adaptation because there is no evidence for evolution. You may, you may know that evolution is now taught in primary schools from the age of four and five. It came in in 2014. Most people think there was some kind of scientific lobby to bring it in. Well, it wasn't. It was Humanists UK. They know where the battlefield is with child's education. And they lobby uh, Parliament uh, constantly to bring in more humanist teaching like evolution into schools, secondary schools and primary schools. If you look on their website, they claim responsibility for that legislation coming in, the teaching of evolution in primary schools. Then the lie that creation is anti-scientific, again referring to this often quoted thing, creation versus evolution is not faith versus science. In 2021, I had a research fellowship at Cambridge for a whole year, and I was looking at those fish jewels, and I studied 10 different uh, fish, and I published a paper in the Institute of Physics, which has now had about 8,000 downloads. It's a review paper um, that's been used widely in the field, and basically, if, if you read the paper, I'm giving 10 examples of irreducible complexity, proof of intelligent design in fish. Uh, the design of fish jewels is really astonishing. It exceeds the best designs that humans can make. If evolution was true, the design we see in nature would be worse than human design, because human designers are not limited to step-by-step -step change. But what we find is that design in the natural world far exceeds what engineers can do, proving that creation has a divine designer. Then there is the lie that humans came from apes. I can show you lots of quotations from people who, scientists who believe in evolution, who will tell you this picture is fake, fake science, not just creationists who say that, but even evolutionists. Just to give you just a few examples, in 2021, not so long ago, Adam Rutherford, a geneticist at UCL, he believes in evolution, but he said, these charts are misleading, they should be out of biology books because there is no evidence for this 
kind of thing uh, happening. They won't be taken out of biology books because the humanists will not allow that to be taken out. Just to give you a couple of other quotations, monkey to man charts, a tosh, monkey to man charts are an illusion and the list goes on. So our children are taught fake science in schools and universities. Let me just give you a few other examples. The lie that humans came from apes. In 1922, there were world headlines that scientists had found uh, this intermediate um, ape man, the missing link between apes and humans. Then, in 1927, it was found to be a pig, not a man. Now, there's an important point here. You, you sometimes hear, well, evolution is science, so you've got to believe it, because it's science. Evolution is historical science. It's not observational science. When it, comes to observa when it comes to observational science, you can be very confident in science. But when it comes to historical science, historical science can be spectacularly wrong, really spectacularly wrong. And this is an example of that. Another one is Piltdown Man in 1912. For many years, children were taught Piltdown Man is an example of a missing link between apes and humans. In 1953, it was found to be a complete fraud. They discovered the scientists who made it up. It was based on no evidence whatsoever. And yet, for 41 years, people believed it and it was taught in schools. And there are lots of other examples uh, you can give. So don't forget, evolution is a historical science which can be spectacularly wrong. The lie that humans came from apes. Now, I've mentioned already Richard Dawkins. He was a professor of the public understanding of science and also a president of Humanists UK. Humanists UK groom the next person to be uh, the professor of the public understanding of science. Alice Roberts has been the president of Humanist UK, and she is now a professor of the public understanding of science. She's a professor at Birmingham University. She teaches anatomy, uh, and she has said her goal in anatomy is to tell people they are apes. They are not humans made in the image of God. She's written this book, The Incredible Unlikeliness of Being, and in that book, she explains evolution is the making of us. Every part of our body has been shaped by evolution, not God. She argues we are not made in the image of God, we're made in the image of an ape. And then she says, we have evolved, men have evolved to, to rape women, we've evolved to fight, survival of the fittest, and she says, forget what the Bible says we're not a little below the angels there we're a little above the beasts down there we are beasts and animals and apes and that's what she teaches children and uh, students at university unsurprisingly richard dawkins says this book gives you a deeper understanding of yourself if you want to understand yourself you've got to understand you are an ape this is the battle we are in today what our children are being taught so, <clears throat> the human voice, uh, mine's not in a very good state at the moment, but the human voice has been described as the ultimate musical instrument. Uh, if you want to buy a really high quality musical instrument, you normally have to pay a lot of money for a good piano, a good cello, maybe thousands of pounds, but nothing beats the beauty of the human voice, the most incredible thing if you have a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, you see that God using his almighty power and creativity and wisdom, he created the human voice that we might sing praises to God. If you have an evolutionary worldview, you have to believe that the human voice evolved for screaming. We only have a voice because we needed it to scream. If we were a woman, we had to scream to protect ourselves from rape. If you're a man, you had to scream to project to hate to the other ape man in the other side of the valley. How can that explain the beauty of the human voice?
voice. Only the biblical worldview explains why we have such a beautiful voice. The lie that humans came from apes. Just to give you one other example, the human hand. I've done research on the human hand, building robotic hands. It is an incredible masterpiece of design. Engineers are in awe of the human hand. It's accuracy. Um, it's dexterity, incredible design. Engineers cannot come close to replicating the human hand. If you have a Christian worldview, you will know the human hand is exactly what we'd expect. God wants us to play musical instruments, to, to sing praises to him. God has designed us with a hand to play the piano, to play the guitar, to play musical instruments. But if you have an evolutionary worldview, how do you explain the human hand? Well, if you read uh, science papers on evolution, it will tell you one of the reasons for the human hand is to form a fist and to punch someone in the face, which is not a very good thing to teach children just before they go to the playground uh, in school. Do you see how damaging evolution is, how it distorts your thinking about the purpose of life, the origin of life, that the purpose of the hand is to punch someone in the face. By the way, the real purpose of our power grip is to hold a squash racket and to play squash. That's why we can do that with our hand. But seriously, our hands are obviously designed for skill, not for punching and clubbing. But because People are so wedded to evolution, they will even write a paper. Well, I think, you know, that's why we have this uh, hand the way it is. The lie that all scientists support evolution. Richard Dawkins, in particular, uh, in his books, he says, no serious biologist doubts evolution. He says that over and over in his books. No serious evolutionist doubts evolution. And that is a lie. I already mentioned Alan Ninton was in this church for decades. He was head of microbiology at Bristol University. He has hundreds of scientific publications, very distinguished scientist, and he totally rejects the theory of evolution. I know at least one other professor of biology at Bristol University who also rejects the theory of evolution. He's not even a Christian. And there are hundreds in the UK, there are thousands in the world, and yet Dawkins says not one serious biologist. And he is telling these lies. James Clark Maxwell wrote a message of protest to the Royal Society against evolution in 1873. He was an elder, I think in the Free Church of Scotland, or one of the churches in Scotland. James Clark Maxwell, uh, is considered by some to be the greatest scientist that ever lived. He explained how magnetism and light uh, joined together through maths and equations. Lord Kelvin, the father of modern thermodynamics, he said, scientific thought is compelled to accept the idea of creative power. He would have protested uh, that statement of Julian Huxley saying, we must rule out special creation. Lord Kelvin said, you must not rule out special creation. And Lord Kelvin is one of the greatest scientists that ever lived. Ambrose Fleming, the founder of modern electronics, all of these three at Cambridge educated. And in 1932, he co-formed the evolution protest movement. And their first pamphlet said, we feel the public are being deceived, evolution propaganda, does not present the facts impartially, it dwells upon those which favour the theory while suppressing those which oppose it. Isn't that incredible? That was written 90 years ago and things have not changed. In fact, things have got worse. These are the three of the greatest scientists that have ever lived. People say to me, if these great scientists were saying, you know, don't believe that ridiculous theory and the humanists people like Julian Huxley were saying we must rule God out how could that happen how can people follow the humanists not the great scientists 
The answer is in Romans chapter 1. It's a spiritual battle. It wouldn't have happened without a spiritual battle. And ultimately, it's not about evidence. It's not. It's a spiritual battle. That is how you understand everything that goes on. One of the things I find very sad, our children and our students are not told this evidence, just like Ambrose Fleming is, is said. Evolution propaganda does not present the facts impartially. Children and students are not told these kind of things. The lie that the human body is badly designed. In recent years, a number of books have, have come out by authors like Abby Hafer, uh, Jerry Coyne, and Nathan Lentz, uh, and, and a few others, including Richard Dawkins, claiming the human body is badly designed, which is really interesting because in my field of biomechanics and biomimetics, all of the researchers I know say the human body is brilliantly designed, fantastically designed. But if you go to a department on evolution, they're all saying the human body is badly designed. Because if evolution is true, the human body should be badly designed. Because if you look at the, the changes that must happen between, say, an ape and a human, it's impossible for evolution to give you a good design from this other design. The problem for the theory of evolution is there is no evidence that humans are badly designed. So this is a key battleground at the moment. So to give you one example, Nathan Lentz in the United States has written a book called Human Errors. And in that book, he argues from head to toe, humans are badly designed. Just to give you an example, in that book, he says, humans have way too many bones. The ankle contains seven bones, most of them pointless. The wrist has eight bones, like a useless pile of rocks. Evolution is poor at deleting bones. He's a geneticist at New York City University. Why did he write the book? He wrote the book because he hates God. He wrote the book because he's a humanist. He wrote the book because he's desperate for people to believe evolution is true. And according to evolution, the human body should be badly designed. So he's written this big book. It's going out to students and schools. And people are reading this book, which is, and the book is complete scientific rubbish. It's fake science. And yet, it's being taught to children and students. In the last five years, I've been doing research on the design of human feet and hands. And so I have entered this debate about whether humans are badly designed. And for example, I've, you can look this up. Uh, last year, I published in Biocomplexity why the ankle foot complex is a masterpiece of engineering. And I also challenge Nathan Lentz and people like him, and I answer all their points. Uh, point by point, showing uh, that what they're talking about is fake science. Nathan Lentz has never done research on the human foot or the human hand. He's just speculating what evolution uh, teaches. But all of my colleagues who work on biomechanics would totally disagree with what Nathan Lentz says. So here's an example of a great battle for truth in the field of origins going on uh, just in very recent years. In fact, uh, this month of October, I have now published another paper on the wonderful design of human feet. It's in the International Journal of Biomimetics. It's one of the top journals. And I've published, uh, it's taken a year to write on the incredible design of the human foot. Again, challenging what Nathan Lentz has said. So this is a very hot uh, topic. Then the lie that God used evolution. Again, people have said to me, you know, how can it be true that evolution is, is wrong? It's, it's, it's so many people believe it. Um, it's been taught for so long. How can it be wrong? Well, first of all, it's not true that everyone believes it. I've spoke, I'm amazed how many scientists I've spoken to 
who've said, I think evolution, you know, it, I don't think it's, it's true. But it's too difficult to change the status quo. And if you criticize evolution, your whole career could be at stake. Uh, so it's actually not true that everyone believes in evolution. But evolution, in a way, is exactly what you'd expect from Satan. If you study Satan, he's the father of lies. So evolution is exactly what you would expect Satan to produce. The whole point of evolution is to support atheism and humanism. Theological problems with theistic evolution. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin. Death came through Adam. If God used evolution, that means God created death and suffering in the original creation, including cancer and those things. The Bible clearly tells us God did not create evil. He didn't create suffering and death. Suffering and death came when Adam and Eve rebelled. They sinned, and then creation was cursed. If you say God used evolution, you have to say God created suffering. He wanted people to suffer through cancer and other things. It's not what the Bible teaches, the Old Testament or the New Testament. If you say God used evolution, there was death before the fall. So Adam did not die for his sin, and if he didn't die for his sin, he didn't even need a saviour. So theistic evolution undermines the whole gospel. And the whole point of evolution is to support um, atheism. There are many other problems with theistic evolution, like Adam's parents. They were humans, but not spiritual. And there are many other such deep uh, theological problems. I mentioned Ambrose Fleming, the father of modern electronics. And he said this, evolution is essentially atheistic, an attempt to dispense with the very idea of God. The whole point of evolution is to support atheism. Sadly, many of our Christian unions up and down the country have some Christians who believe in theistic evolution, mainly because of the Faraday Institute in Cambridge. Dennis Alexander is a, is a, is a Christian, a professor um, at Cambridge, and he has written a book um, supporting theistic evolution, and sadly, that has done a huge amount of damage in the church. Many churches and Christians um, have been uh, influenced by it. Alan Linton, I already mentioned, he was in this church for decades, very godly man, great, wonderful preacher. Uh, he's still alive today. He might be in his 90s. This is what he wrote in the foreword to my book, Hallmarks of Design. He wrote, evolution is a man-made theory to explain the origin and continuance of life without reference to a creator. The whole point of evolution is to attack God, to attack the Bible to support atheism and humanism. And these, there are many great scientists who have said it as bluntly as that. And I'm glad to have this link with this church, with Alan Linton. It was very brave of him to do that. Um, it, at Bristol University, you would have thought this would have caused a riot. But of course, what the evolutionists do, they just sweep this under the carpet. You know, don't tell anyone that Professor Anna Linton has said evolution is basically rubbish. Um, don't tell the students that Professor Anna Linton said that. Uh, but it should have caused uh, an earthquake. But as Ambrose Fleming said, evolution, propaganda, it's propaganda and it's very much manipulated. The lie that humans are worthless. There's a lot of impacts. This isn't a theoretical discussion. The biblical worldview is that man is crowned with glory and honor. Man is the pinnacle of creation. Man is made in the image of God. 
How encouraging is that? How inspiring is that? To know that we are made in the image of God, crowned with glory and honour. What a contrast with evolution that says, you're just an animal, you're just an ape. Don't forget, you are an ape, and a pretty worthless ape. This is what Professor Peter Atkins has said, we are just a bit of slime on a planet. So that's not very inspiring, is it? And Richard Dawkins has said, the universe, no purpose, no evil, no good, no nothing, but blind, pitiless indifference. So what we're talking about has an influence, it has an impact. It's not just a theoretical thing and it's not just a salvation thing. We need to believe in a creator because we must give account to that creator when we die. I've been at Bristol University for 26 years and I had seven years as head of department. I also had other several years as a senior tutor, meaning I had to deal with the most uh, vulnerable students with mental health problems. In 1997, when I arrived at Bristol University, and by the way, these figures are the same for the whole, for the whole country, so it's not, it's not actually picking on one university. In 1997, but it was the same at Bristol. In 1997, 4% of all the engineers were on watch, meaning we had to watch out for them because they had some mental uh, weakness. Then in 2002, it jumped to 6%. I was head of department in this period, and I noticed it jumped to 9% in 2007 to 13% in 2012. And I know the reason it was increasing. It is the humanist world view. You are just a bit of slime on a planet. You are worthless. You are just made in the image of an ape. And I've seen, for example, young men thinking, who, who am I? Can I be masculine? Um, confused who they are, even more so today, of course. And it has an effect on the mental health of students. What do you think that number was last year? It's now 25%. One quarter of the cohort of students in our universities are on watch for mental health problems. This is the impact of the LGBT, trans ideologies of today, which started with evolution, but has spawned these other ideologies. It has a real impact on the health of society, children, and students. So it's not a theoretical um, debate. It has a big impact. Uh, just to give you uh, one other quotation, Daily Telegraph, young men are in crisis. I'm not surprised with the people that I've spoken to at the university. By the way, I've had the privilege of being a tutor to probably hundreds of students over 26 years. And these numbers are not true of Christians. Uh, the Christians who I have seen come to my university do not follow this trend at all. They're protected by the biblical world view. The lie that modern science is open to the truth. The whole point of science is to be open to the truth. If people like Isaac Newton were here today, they would be astonished and they would be dismayed, saying, how can you just rule out God? That's the most ridiculous thing. If you need a God, then you should have God. Um, and if you need a God to bring the universe into existence, which you do, then what is the point of ruling out God? What a stupid thing uh, to do. And yet, modern science is not open to any thinking of God. So in 2000, I wrote my book, Hallmarks of Design, which Alan Ninton kindly did a forward uh, to. And it was fascinating when I produced my book because a lot of my colleagues said, do not write this book. And what? And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, 
if you write a design argument book, it's okay if it goes in the theology library, yeah, you can write that, but don't say this is anything to do with science. And I said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I've got to go ahead. In fact, one of the things they said is, what you should do is wait till you've retired and then write the book. And I said, well, I retire in 26 years, so I'm not going to wait that long. So I just ignored them. Then they said, do not put your qualifications on the book. And I said, well, why can't I do that? And I say, well, someone might think scientists believe in a creator. And I say, well, lots of scientists believe in a creator, so I will put my qualifications on my book. Then they said, well, put a disclaimer on your book and say, you're the only person who believes this kind of thing. And I said, but I'm not the only person who and so I went through all of these uh, cycles. They said that even if I was in a church like this, I should say that what I'm saying is not connected to my science. Even speaking, that's what they wanted. That's what the humanists wanted. Um, and I explained that most of what's in the book is connected to my research. It would be lying if I said um, it's not connected. And many people wrote to my university saying things like this, does the university approve of its name being attached to the creation books? If it does not endorse this material, what action does it intend to take? Lots of emails saying the university should take action against me because I write a book in support of a creator. If Isaac Newton was in a university today, it was, was working in a university today, he would be sacked, he would be chucked out because he believes in a creator God. That's how they would treat um, him. There was quite a battle on this, and I really appreciate the support I had at Bristol University because they told me, I, I, they said I, they were happy for me to put my connection with Bristol University on my books. There was a bit of a battle that went on. I've had one kind of via a newspaper, a little bit of a debate with uh, Dawkins, and he said a really interesting thing. He said, maybe Burgess and Macintosh are right and all the rest of us are wrong. This was in a debate in the Guardian newspaper. Not just slightly wrong, but catastrophically, appallingly, devastatingly wrong. He's saying, you know, if Burgess and Macintosh are right, we've been teaching this rubbish theory all of these decades. If Burgess and Macintosh are right, the scientific establishment has fallen. What he should have said is to do with evolution. Um, so basically, I, I agree with what Richard Dawkins is saying here. Because um, I think we are right. And I think the whole theory of evolution, uh, yeah, it needs to fall. So all this is a battle of two world views. This is the most important thing to remember. You have the doctrine of creation, the high view of man, the dogma of humanism, the low view of man. The high view says we are made in God's image, little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor. Evolution says we're a little above the beasts, insignificant. And so it's not surprising that today we have support for abortion, and all the ideologies that we have. Because if you say that man is just an ape, just an animal, worthless, then this is the consequence of those ideologies. I hope you found that encouraging. If you have any specific questions, the best thing is to email me, because I can't stay too long. Um, there are these particular books that you can get, particularly from day one, uh, publications, day one publications, you can find that on the website. This week I have a new book coming out, the first book for a couple of years, and it's called The Gift of Sport, and it comes out this week. It's an evangelistic book written with my daughter, uh, Tabitha Karen, and it says, it describes how sport reveals the design, the wonderful design of the human body. It also talks of the good and the bad aspects of sport, including idolatry in sport, um, bringing it back to the gospel. So if you have difficulties thinking of Christmas presents this year, this could be a good evangelistic Christmas uh, 
present, but uh, my prayer is that you would be encouraged. I really appreciate the boldness of this church and your pastor uh, speaking in defense of a creator, speaking in defense of the Bible. So please keep it up. And remember, you stand shoulder to shoulder with the greatest scientist that ever lived. Thank you and God bless you.